Galatians chapter 5, I'm just going to walk through verse 22 and 23, and then I'll have some other references for you. Uh, This morning I want to look particularly and specifically at uh, goodness that we see uh, as a part of this list that we know as the fruit of the Spirit. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. So I was driving here this morning uh, anticipating sharing this with you, and I was thinking about a conversation that I had with a family member uh, some years ago, uh, really who was in opposition to Christianity, uh, opposition to um, the faith that I was growing in, that I was Um, convinced of. And so he took it upon himself to start an argument, because that's what you do when you're trying to understand a person, right, Um, is you argue. And so we had this long conversation, and and, and he basically said, in essence, I don't understand this whole Jesus thing and why you have to submit your life to him. All you need to do is be a good person. Have you ever heard that before, right? Um, I just want need to be a good person. We sh- I'm a good person. And that is uh, a thought that many people have, that sort of the goal of life, the goal even of the Christian life for many people, is that they're just good. But this is kind of interesting because we read here that goodness is a fruit of the Spirit, but then we read in like Romans 3 where it says that no one is good. And so how do we reconcile that? So, so that's kind of what I want to walk through uh, this morning. Before we get into the specific um, details of goodness, I do want to build a little bit of context, um, thinking through the fruit of the Spirit. Um, when we think of the fruit of the Spirit, particularly the specific um, virtues, if you will, of the fruit of the Spirit, we need to be mindful of the fact that these are not abstract thoughts that we should strive to possess. Um, These are also not suggestions. These are actually aspects of God's character that we are enabled to live out through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, So to say this more pointedly, uh, possession of these qualities is contingent on the Holy Spirit being present. Uh, This is hard for some people to hear. Um, It might even be objectional because there might be an individual that you can look at that would live up to the standard of what the world would call uh, a moral, that they weren't a believer, they're not a believer, but they're patient, they're self-controlled. They don't, they, they didn't want anything to do with Christ, but they were kind They were gentle. Uh, They had no interest in things of the faith, but uh, he or she was a good man or a good woman. There's lots of um, published materials that can offer this idea in depth, uh, but I'd like to offer a distinction to kind of help build this up as we're looking at um, this idea of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Because for the Christian, there is a different standard. Uh, The Christian is primarily to be about the business of seeking the true virtue uh, or ethic, if you want to call it that, of glorifying God. And so the true virtue that is evident in any life or action that is done um, should be for the ultimate purpose of loving and glorifying God. That is the difference. What the Holy Spirit enables us to do is to glorify God. That is what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's not just so that people can look at you and say you are a good person. You are a loving person. You are a self-controlled person. The reason that the Holy Spirit enables us to live out these virtues is for the ultimate purpose of glorifying the Lord. And that's the distinction. When we are talking about the fruit of the Spirit, that is what that fruit does. So, although it's possible 
uh, to meet a level of morality that does not seek to contribute to God's glory, when it's stripped to its core, um, this morality is actually not even true virtue. Have you, ever, have you ever seen someone who is a philanthropist or someone who gives lots of money out? Uh, oftentimes, they talk about themselves. Well, this is what I feel I needed to do. I saw an injustice. I saw a need. And they bring that glory to themselves. The reason that we exhibit the fruits of the Spirit is to glorify God and not ourselves. So to try to unmuddy the waters a bit, um, again, apart from the Holy Spirit working in us, um, that is how this fruit is produced. Um, we cannot reach that standard um, that we are called to as believers without the Holy Spirit then. And so we have to remember that as well. And so the Christian ethic, if you will, is aimed at a higher and truer cause. So that brings us then to look intently and specifically at the fruit of the Spirit called goodness. Now, I don't really want to give you an exhaustive list of good acts that we can live into. I've heard many sermons on the fruit of the Spirit, and it's just like a list of things that you can do. I really don't think that's very helpful. Um, I instead want to look at where goodness comes from. And again, of course, it comes from the Holy Spirit, and we need to live into that. But there is a fundamental truth to those who are in Christ that we have to understand. And so if I were to survey people, um, if I were to ask a group of individuals, maybe even this group, um, if I were to say, do you think that you are a good person, how many of you would answer in the negative? Probably not many. But answering in the affirmative would then lead to another question. What is then the basis of your goodness? Uh, we also tend to attribute this word goodness or good uh, to all types of things. We, we attribute this to people, uh, food or a meal like the lobster tails last night, right? I'm sure somebody said, man, this is, this is good, right? Uh, outcomes of situations. It was a good outcome as opposed to a negative or a bad one, and so on. It's this uh, rather versatile word um, that's often used when comparing uh, what is commonly understood to be bad or evil. So it's like the opposite of that. Um, yet this is actually a pretty shallow way uh, to look at this idea of goodness because it's much more than the opposite of bad or evil. And it's much more than just moral, upright behavior. Uh, to understand goodness, again, there's a fundamental truth that will need to be the starting point in understanding goodness, and it's that goodness does not naturally dwell within us. So I, I mentioned this uh, earlier, and Pastor Ron has walked through this um, more in depth, Romans 3 tells us, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. And so the truth of our lives is that we must judge our perceived goodness in relation to perfection, namely God himself. And so when you and I put our lives up against a perfect God, what do we discover? We discover that we are deviant, that we are a transgressor, that we are rebellious, that we are more prone to have evil emanate from us uh, than for us to emanate good. Uh, goodness is only a reality in the life of a believer that is present because of the Holy Spirit's presence and work in their lives. Uh, there was this one occasion where Jesus was speaking to a group of religious people. Uh, we know them as the Pharisees. Uh, and he said, you brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? Uh, to those that if you were to ask the community, uh, who were the good people around here? Who are the people that you could look up to? They would probably pick these individuals. And Jesus looks at them in the eye and he calls them a pile of rattlesnakes. 
He says, you can't say one thing good. And you can't say one thing good because your heart is evil. So understanding goodness begins with knowing that goodness does not naturally dwell within us. And to deepen our understanding even more, we must see our hearts correctly. Um, I coach a flag football team um, for my son, both of my sons now, and uh, I have an assistant coach. love him. I think he's a great guy. Um, but the other day, he said to my kids, and I cringed inside, he said, just follow your hearts. And I was like, oh, no, don't tell him that. Don't tell him that. Don't follow your hearts. Because your hearts are deceitful above all things. Desperately sick. That's what Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us. Apart from Christ, we do not love the truth. We rationalize the irrational. We defend the indefensible. We harbor a secret sin. Uh, Matthew Henry comments, there is wickedness in our hearts, which we ourselves are not aware of and do not suspect to be there. So that's why I cringed. Following our hearts is a bad idea because it leads you straight into wickedness. The more we know ourselves, the more that we understand the word of God, the more we will understand how our hearts are deceitful and wicked. And the more we know that good does not naturally dwell within us. By nature, none of us are consistently doing good. This is what Romans 7 talks about. Paul uh, talks about how he has, and subsequently we have, a major problem. And I'll leave that to Ron to explain that in detail. Um, he talks about how there's this bad dimension to me, and there's a bad dimension to all of us. And so that's why goodness is such a, a challenge. And so with this sobering truth in front of us, one might ask the question, um, so then, how does the work of goodness begin in someone's life? How does this become evident? Well, it's not that God looks from heaven and sees um, that we are good and thinks to himself, I can make PT a little bit better. Or I can make Teo a little bit better. Uh, he begins uh, looking down on us from heaven and he sees that there's nothing good in us. And all because of his grace and his mercy, he begins then a good work within us. It is actually a, a counsel of despair to think that by our own effort or commitments that we can be found to be good. It is only through the grace of God that goodness can be evident in our life. It is only through the grace of God that this work can be done. And it is only in those who are persistent in following Christ that this good work begins. But again, we may agree with this. Amen. But there are a lot of people who think that they will get into heaven because they were basically a good person. And so the pessimist in me would want to say, well, then how good are you? How good do you then need to be on the scale to get into heaven then? How many good things do you need to do then to get into heaven? We have a tremendous problem, uh, both theologically and doctrinally and practically, when we begin to believe that goodness is the means to inheriting the kingdom of God rather than goodness being produced in us as an act of God's great grace and mercy. So then, with this foundation, how is goodness then defined in Scripture? Well, Micah 6.8 gives us a rather concise definition. Uh, this is where the prophet Micah, speaking from God, says, He has told you, O man, what is good. 
And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Did you notice that these are all framed in active verbs? So if we, if we finish reading uh, 24 through 26 in Galatians 5, so it gives the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. This is very similar. So in Micah, we see this framed in active verbs, and we see this same idea here in Galatians 5. He admonishes those in Galatia to walk out. That's action, right? To keep in step with the Spirit. That's an action. And so it shows us that the fruit of the Spirit, specifically goodness, should be operative in our lives. Active. That doesn't mean that you're always going to have all of them at all times. You're not perfect. I'll say that again. You're not perfect. So you're not going to hit these all at the same time, but they should be evident in your life. I know it's not our job to judge people's salvation. I know people argue about that all the time. Some say you can, some say you should, some say that whatever. I don't care. Let's not fight about that. But you could certainly see the fruit in the life of someone who is an authentic believer. And if you don't, you have right to question if their salvation is legitimate. So this is produced. It's active. We see it. Uh, they're not dormant or inoperative. And so you cannot claim to be walking in the Spirit, living in God's fullness, bearing His fruit, if there is not that constant uh, seeking after a life of these fruits or a dabbling with sin. Uh, you can't be playing around with filthy thoughts. You can't waltz with destructive behavior and claim that you're walking and keeping in step with the spirit goodness is consistent with and it flows from a life that is full of the holy spirit and of faith that goodness again is a result of the work of the holy spirit and is present in the, in the life of those to whom the spirit is working. So it would be critical for us to then walk through how it is made known. How then is it seen and demonstrated? Well, Ephesians 2, 18, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 tells us, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that, one, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, I cannot, by being a good person, earn my acceptance before God. That comes through the work of the cross, that because of that act on our behalf, we are given a righteousness that we cannot gain or secure on our own. And even further, because we have been accepted then by God, we have therefore been set apart by God to do good works. It's not just that you do good works to be accepted by God. It is because of God's work in your life, because of the cross, that then these good works are seen uh, to seek the betterment of others, uh, to contribute to the places in which we find ourselves, to be generous and benevolent or caring, to be gracious and compassionate, to be loving and forgiving, that the inward working of the Holy Spirit is revealed in our external acts. So, not that I'm trying to exhaust this idea, but I want you to understand this idea, uh, specifically of goodness, that it is totally a work of the Holy Spirit. I know I probably could have said that in two minutes and then let you go, but to give you a scriptural a biblical foundation for that is, is really important. And so to close, I want to take us to Acts chapter 11, um, verse 22 through 24, and it introduces to us a man named Barnabas. Uh, you probably have, have experienced and understood and heard of this man before. But I want to I show you something that I think 
uh, helps bring this point home, um, you know, from a, a, a micro, you know, sort of view, um, you know, we can look at this and see this idea of goodness, but mainly through uh, what the, the acts of the Holy, the fruit of the Spirit actually are. So we see in Acts 11, 20 through 22 through 24, this man named Barnabas. Here's what it says about him. It says, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he, cu- when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them. He, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Now, here's this word. For he was a good man. Wait a second. I thought nobody was good. But here's the next few words that are important. Full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. And so Barnabas is described as generous and honest. He showed patience and unselfishness. He was good. And goodness was only evident in his life because he was full of the Holy Spirit. And only because he was full of the Holy Spirit in his life. And so this is an important truth for us to remember. I'm not trying to put you down. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to help you see that whatever good comes from us, whatever fruit of the Spirit is evident in our life is completely and totally a work of God. And if that's all that you get out of this 20-something minutes together, that's, that's all that I was hoping for. But this is foundational to our faith. This is, this is critical. Some people say, well, that, that's kind of basic theology. That's basic doctrine. Well, we need reminded of the basics sometimes. And so as you go about the work that the Lord has called you to do here, please remember that it is not by your own power that you can do that work. It is because of the work of the Holy Spirit in you that you are able to do that work. Any good quality that any person would call out in you is evidence of the Holy Spirit at work. And it only takes a second for you to be truly honest with yourself to see that if you did not have the Holy Spirit, even for a millisecond, where you would end up. And if we could understand that, I think we'd all be better off. We'd all be in a place Uh, to where we can continue to be faithful uh, to what it is that the Lord has called us to do. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. I pray, Lord, that as we go our separate ways today to do that work that you've called us to, uh, that we would be mindful um, that it is only because of your spirit that we are able to do that. There is nothing intrinsically good inside of us. It is only by your grace, it is only by your mercy that there can be any evidence of these virtues in our life. And so may we remember that today. Uh, May we walk uh, in step with the Holy Spirit so that these can be evident to the world around us. For we know that you uh, have them worked in us and through us ultimately to bring you glory. And so may we understand that and may we know that today. We love you, we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.